phonetics as what people actually do, speaker and a hearer, then we can see that, as I already mentioned at the start, you can relate that to a very simple communication model. Life is much more complex than that. It's not just about a speaker um, sending information across a code to a hearer. But that's a good start, you know, to get to the finer details. Um, so how does phonetics tie into that? As a first part, we can look at what the sender is doing. Okay? Um, so you look at the articulation process, how he or she produces sounds. It all starts in the brain, however big or small it might be. Um, and then, you know, muscles are used and you do something and you produce a sound. This is what articulation articulatory phonetics looks at. It's the sender's perspective. If you look at the code, the channel, the airwaves, then we know if I speak to you, I put air molecules into motion. They travel from me to you, and you then process them. And this is also um, a field of phonetics, because you can measure airwaves. I mean, there are airwaves, because otherwise radio wouldn't work, uh, and otherwise we couldn't talk. Um, and so that is something you can, you can measure with computer technology, uh, with special instruments. And that is, for example, what you then get. The details of this are not material to um, our lecture. It's more important that you can do it. You know, that This is a field of phonetics um, that obviously requires a lot of technical training. But in this example, what you get is you get three different words, bead, bit, and bade, three sets of English words, which only differ with respect to their second sound. Um, and the frequency analyses, um, because um, when I speak, it's not just a simple wave, it's several things going on at the same time, um, and you can then plot this and look at it. Finally, moving on to auditory phonetics. So now that the airwaves have made their way from me to you, they arrive at your ear, um, and they do something there. They um, go through the ear canal, there's something which looks um, a bit like a snail, the so-called cochlea, it's processed there, it's put into um, electricity that is processed in your brain. Um, very funky stuff, um, which is also very, very complex, which is why we're sort of shoving that aside a bit. However, and that is something I would like you to pay close attention to now, um, and again, something I can't really do myself, is the fact that it's not just simple input stuff that goes straight to your brain. Your brain does something with that. It's the same with vision, you know, it's you don't just see pictures, um, you compute something, um, which is why you get those um, um, kip builder where you see two things at the same time, where you uh, see things which might be missing the kind of um, holistic psych psychology that you get in gestalt theory. Um, but how does it all relate to um, auditory phonetics? There is something which is innocently enough called the McGurk effect. It's just, I mean, this is something you've got to just, just keep in mind. You don't need to just retell it. It was an experiment, I can't even say 1960s or something like that, by someone called McGurk. And what he did is he had a television screen uh, where people just saw the lips of other people speaking. And so they would see someone say, saying, um, ah, or oh. Now that's straight enough, you know, you see that someone says, Oh, and you see the lips. Now, in real life, this is going to correspond because how you shape your lips is going to influence how you produce it. But with um, technology, what you can do is you can show people a picture of an R and have someone say, oh. Okay, so what they see on the screen is, what they hear is, oh. I can't do it simultaneously, but you get the idea. Now, what we would assume is, you know, if sound travels via the ear, gets to your ear, goes to your brain, um, then what you see shouldn't really matter, right? Those are just lips. They might be lovely lips or uh, not so attractive lips, but it doesn't matter. You should just hear what you hear. But the thing is, people didn't do that. They heard what they saw. They heard because they heard what they saw. So if they saw an, they heard an R ah despite hearing an or, and that is weird. Something really weird is going on there. It just shows you um, how the brain can be manipulated, but how what we perceive, what we hear, is also influenced um, well by, by lots of other stuff. So that shows you that um, auditory phonetics is not just about the sounds making their way to your brain. It is about um, you interpreting, your brain doing some serious work. 